Okay, so we're going to talk about fitting in, standing out, and standing apart. And I'm going to try to convince you to all want and strive to uh, stand apart, because that's where the fun is. <clears throat> but first of all, I love this business. I love design, and I love the technologies that make it possible. Uh, it's a real phenom to be able to spend your whole career doing something that you absolutely love. I mean, from day one, the chance to use my skills, you know, early on as an illustrator, then as a designer, it's like, wow, fantastic. And I assume all of you, or certainly most of you, have had the same experience. Design Week is a publication I follow, and yesterday morning... Uh, there was this article <clears throat> that was inspired by because some school or something was starting over there. And uh, editors asked designers in London uh, <clears throat> how they got started. And every one of them described some childhood experience of you know, falling in love with the original mini <laughs> automobile or doing some illustration and having a teacher give them wonderful feedback or seeing some piece of jewelry and just being, you know, blown away by it, or getting a claim from doing a watercolor, or whatever it is. Not one, and it went on and on. I mean, there, not one of them talked about, I got into this business to make money, and I made a bunch of money, and blah, 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 blah. They all did it. They're all doing it for love, just like I, just like I do it for love, and still do it for love. But there's a problem. But this we do it for love works against us as well as for us, pretty obviously. And the last line there, which I know you can't read in the back, says, hence this talk so we can all make a little money as well as have fun. Hence this talk. So fit in, stand out, stand apart. And believe me, standing apart is where the money is. And in my view, it's where the fun is too. So a little bit about what fit in is in my view. You're hired as a professional because you're in the category. You're a brand designer, you're a UI UX designer, you're a packaging designer, uh, you uh, uh, design and reports, you do messaging, you are known as being competent in the category, you're sort of in the club. Um, that's where we all start, you know, that's, that's, we go to school to, to get in the club, if you will. And sometimes we can have a whole career where we just stay in the club, and that's fine. You know, we freelance, we do whatever. Standing out is the next step. Your work is widely recognized as the best, best of the best in your category. You're invited to pitch. You receive RFIs and RFPs monthly, weekly. You're doing beautiful work. You're featured in all the design blogs and print publications but you're competing for everything and price pressure is on you in down times and sometimes you strive ahead and you, you do really well, but other times you fall back and it's always competitive. It's always competitive. You're always, sure your work is the best of the best, but you're always fighting, scrambling for the next, for the next opportunity. And then there's stand apart. You're selected without any real competition. You're selected without any real competition. Sure, there may be a competitor involved, but you've got a coach who's already told you that you're going to win and, you're, and has set it up and smoothed the way for you. Uh, your unique skill set, skill set and expertise is basically it's difficult to replicate. That's critical. By the way, I pulled that phrase out of, the Wall Street, out of a Wall Street Journal article this morning <laughs> because it was better than what I had up there before. <laughs> So it was, it was an economist talking about the 1%, and he was talking about the athletes and the rock stars and people who have skills that are very difficult to replicate, skills that we, that we need, that we want. So I think we should think of ourselves like that. 
your unique skill set and expertise is difficult to replicate. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of ways of doing this. We're going to talk about that today. You can stand apart selectively, where you're the only person selected for a job with no competition. And I bet lots of you have had that experience, where you were called in to do something. They know you. They trust you. They know you're going to do a great job. They know you have the skills. There is no competition. That's selectively standing apart. And then you can do it sweepingly. You can sweepingly stand apart, which is where the real fun is and where the real money is. <clears throat> Design leaders all stand apart by using their expertise effectively. You're going to hear a lot, you're going to hear me use the word expertise over and over again because you are experts and your power, your real power in the world is in your expertise. Raymond Lowy, little history lesson here. Raymond Lowy, industrial design, his strap line was never leave well enough alone. He basically invented the industrial design category the way we think of it today. He invented it. He started with nothing. He started as an immigrant with no money doing shoe illustrations in New York for newspaper ads. And he created the industrial design category. Lester Beal, corporate identity, designer as business consultant. He basically got graphic designers into the C-suite for the first time. That's what Lester Beal did. He got graphic designers to sit down with the chairman of the board of international paper and talk about corporate identity and why it was so important. Huge leap from being little service operators selling designs to advertising agencies to meeting with the chairman of the board of the biggest paper company in the US. Charles and Ray Ames, truly multidisciplinary geniuses, furniture, exhibits, architecture, films. The Power of Ten is one of the most copied films ever made. I'm sure you've all seen it. They just did a documentary on Charles and Ray Ames. Include, and it, it's lovely. I really recommend that you see it. I saw it a few months ago uh, on a trip back east. And uh, it talks about their relationship between Charles and Ray, which I love because it, you know, they had high points and low points and the business itself and how it related to the two of them. <clears throat> and it reminded me a lot of my, of my ex relationship with Carolyn, who's been my life partner and my business partner. And we obviously didn't do what those guys did, but, but the kind of feelings and stuff that they dealt with were very similar. Terrence Conran, lifestyle design, the house books, stores, restaurants, furniture. Uh, he's been knighted. He basically changed the whole way that people think about their interiors. He wrote the first house book. Uh, in fact, when we sold the business because the, uh, Terrence Conran was on the board of Fitch at that time, uh, <laughs> Carolyn made the buyers promise that they would introduce, him, uh, introduce her to him. <laughs> of course, it never happened, you know. <laughs> they said, sure, 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 just give me the money. Uh, Rodney Fitch, who worked for Terrence Conran, you know, store design, I call him the high street titan of the branded environment. That firm had a thousand employees in the 80s and early 90s, all over Europe, all over the world. A thousand employees doing store design. He basically created the category of store, store design. Walter Landor, strategic design biggest brand consultancy in the world. I think it's something like double the size of uh, their nearest competitor, which I believe is Interbrand. Anybody here from Landor? Used to be. Used to be, yeah. Uh, remarkable story. Walter Landor started in his apartment hand lettering cigarette packages on his kitchen table and then going down to the smoke shop and having customers come in and choose which one they thought they would buy. So he kind of invented design research, at least at that level. Guy started with nothing. <clears throat> IDO, Tom Kelly, innovation. From design to innovation, the best repositioning job in the last 20, since Landor did brand. 
the best repositioning job, created a whole category that didn't even exist. A design, but just a bunch of industrial designers down in California created a whole category that simply didn't exist before. The rumor is that IDEO gets a million bucks for a 25-page deck. The rumor is IDEO gets a million bucks for a 25-page deck. Unbelievable. I hope it's true. <laughs> I hope it's true. There's hope, you know. So those are, the, those are people through history in our business that have sweepingly stood apart, sweepingly stood apart. Now, I'm going to tell you three stories working with clients, individual clients. One of them was myself, uh, and how it was done selectively, how it was done selectively. But first... I'm going to talk a little bit about the virtuous cycle. And this is one of my favorite subjects. There's a piece I wrote on it a long time ago on my website. I encourage you to read it. Because most people in our business, especially people working in small creative businesses, do not effectively understand or use the principles of the virtuous cycle, which is an economics idea. Virtuous cycle, vicious circle. My mother used to say to me when I was little, you're in a vicious circle here because of my behavior. I didn't really realize that it was actually a term that economists used. Anyway, so here's what we do in our business. We win a new project. We do some planning. We do some creative. We work with the client, get some approvals and some feedback. We produce it. We launch it. And you know, then we have a great story at the end. And then we look around for the next job. And then we look around for the next job. And when you're small, and if you're in a little niche, sometimes the work just keeps coming in, and everything's cool, and it's not a problem. But if you get a little larger, or there's a downturn, there could be a big problem. So what you need is you need to do the marketing side of the virtuous cycle. <clears throat> and so you go from having a great story about a project to creating an insight about that project. So you learn something from that project that's valuable that you can use to talk about. And then you create some messaging off of your insight, some messaging that you can use for PR, you can use when you give public talks, you can use uh, in your marketing literature, you can use it on your website, it's, you can tweet it. I've just recently discovered tweeting, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> And then what happens is inbound calls. Inbound calls are the most marvelous thing in the world because they are self-selecting customers. They are people who have already decided that you fit them because of the way you've talked. Your insight fits them perfectly. They call you. They've already defined themselves as a potential customer. Marvelous. So then you negotiate a deal, and I'm on a terror these days about negotiations because I see our industry just getting beaten to a bloody pulp by the procurement revolution that's going on in America. And I'll talk about that a little later. I'm very passionate about it. Then you negotiate the deal, and you close the deal, and you then have a new project, and the cycle is complete. The cycle is complete. This is the basic business cycle of any business, any business, this is the business cycle of General Motors, as well as little Teddy Lenhart. Expertise is the critical factor in completing the virtuous cycle. It's your, talking about your expertise and what sets you apart. OK, three stories. Three stories. These are true stories. They have been changed. Names have been changed, and lots of facts have been changed to disguise <clears throat> the people involved, except this one, because it's about me. <laughs> So this is a story about how I discover the leverage that comes from expertise, how I personally discovered the leverage that comes from expertise. So I worked for Boeing. I was 22 years old. My wife was pregnant. Uh, I was doing freelance to cover the cost of the baby. Uh, I loved doing the freelance because it exposed me to the creative community. I was desperate to get out of Boeing, naturally. Uh, it was my first job right out of, Bur <laughs> right out of Burnley. Uh, they called me a design illustrator. 
and my supervisor liked me, and a call came in to him from a friend of his who worked for Nicholson Manufacturing. They manufactured machines for the wood products industry that like ate trees or something like that, you know, some kind of big tree eating equipment used in logging and stuff. And so uh, they said they needed an illustrator to do an illustration of a, a new machine that they were planning to build. And my supervisor said, hey, kid, you need some money? Go, go down there and meet these guys. So I made an appointment. I called them and, and got an appointment. And I went in. And I still remember, you know, it's like it, the place is uh, just south of the Spokane Street viaduct. And it was kind of in that city light industrial area down there. And it, you know those buildings all have those cool things on the top. And they had tanks and smokestacks. And, and then they had a little house where the office was. It must have been, the house must have been left over from when that area was a neighborhood. Anyway, so I go in. And when I entered the room, their drawings were already on the table. So a couple of engineers who want to talk to me about this illustration. And they had the big uh, elevations of this machine all spread out on the conference room table. And they wanted, to talk about, uh, they wanted to talk about the illustration. So I wisely didn't show my portfolio. I wisely didn't tell them how fabulous I was. I started asking them questions about their machine and what it did and what their business was and how they might use the illustration and uh, what their process was and how fast they needed it and stuff like that. So I made the conversation all about them. And I think I just did it instinctively. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I realized later, like this week when I was putting this show together, <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> much later, <laughs> that number one, I just picked up five things that happened there. Number one, I worked for Boeing. That was huge cred. Huge cred right there. Number two, I worked as an illustrator in a group that supported design engineering. They supported giant design engineering. These guys were design engineers, so perfect. Number three, they knew and respected my supervisor who had recommended me. And number four, <clears throat> I had been recommended as being perfect for the job. Perfect for the job. And number five, I behaved, this is really critical, I behaved as though I had the job as an expert would. They called me in, they called in the doctor, and the doctor prescribed the medicine. So, as I said, I didn't show my book, I asked them questions about their machine. Asking questions is key to being an expert because your questions naturally are very well informed because you have lots of experience. And the questions gets them talking about themselves and their need and their organization, all of which makes us human beings feel really good about ourselves because nobody's ever really interested enough in us. And it's important because you gain all the information. So at the conclusion of the meeting, I said to them, in my experience, a project like this takes three weeks with a fee of $1,000. Very important, the phrase, in my experience, in my experience. I didn't say, I think, or what would you think of, or how about. I said, in my experience, a project like this takes three weeks with a fee of $1,000. I picked the $1,000 out of the air because I had heard that downtown Seattle illustrators for top projects got $1,000. And I figured I'd better start high, and I needed the money. <clears throat> They didn't bat an eye, and they said, great, three weeks, fabulous. Keep in touch with this, gave me all the drawings, off I went. I had just used my experience to establish my value. I had just used my experience to establish my value. Behaving like an expert, I stood apart, reinforcing their perceptions. They already saw me as standing apart because of the things that happened with my boss at Boeing. OK, story number two. This is a true story. The facts have been shuffled around. The city's changed. The name's changed, et cetera. Bob makes a deal. God, I love drawing those things. It's just so fun. Carolyn said I should have put more of them in. Uh, um, 
Mitz Katayama inspired my drawing style, by the way. I don't know if anybody here remembers his name now. Uh, he was fabulous. Okay, so Bob. Bob runs a firm with like 15 employees, big city. Um, he is huge in luxury branding. He's got huge experience in luxury branding. Big, big, great time for luxury branding, I'll tell you. I understand Rolls-Royce, I read this morning, is just redoing their biggest model. <clears throat> anyway, uh, Bob uh, was sitting down to breakfast with me. We had talked on the phone many times. I'd never actually met him. I was in his city. We made a date. We're going to have breakfast together. And he tells me this story, basically, before he even takes a bite. And the story is that that a guy that he's worked with for years who's brought him business, a marketer in the luxury category, uh, and a good friend of him, so a good guy, and he's known him for a long time, <clears throat> wants, him to, uh, wants him to design a luxury brand for a group of entrepreneurs that are going to create a brand new luxury brand, and they're all investing in this thing. And they want Bob to, to be a, an equity partner. And Bob is thrilled with this. Uh, so, number one, Bob's stand-apart expertise. So he has huge stand-apart expertise, and I'll just walk you through it. Fifteen years as a design firm owner. He started as a packaging designer in Paris on luxury brands. He started as a packaging designer in Paris on luxury brands. He's an American, but he went over there. He spoke French because his parents uh, spent a lot of time in, in, uh, in Paris, and uh, he spoke French uh, like a native, which is something I'm very jealous of. And, uh, uh, and he knew, he really knew uh, luxury branding. And what was I going to say there? I forgot. Anyway, next. Uh, and then he moved from there to leading a luxury studio in one of New York City's top packaging firms. So, so he, you know, huge cred. Oh, by the way, when he was in Paris, one of the things that he loved was seeing the owners of these brands sweep in to view creative. And they, they would have an entourage. They would arrive in some magnificent vehicle. They would have dogs. You know, there would be an entourage. There would be people taking notes, you know, <laughs> lunch dates being made with the president. You know, I mean, it was, you know, it was all these signals of what this life was like was very appealing to Bob. Uh, anyway, so he came back to the States. He got a great job in New York with one of the top packaging firms and basically ran their luxury studio. And he's basically spent his life studying and designing for luxury buyers. He's spent his life really understanding why people will pay 10 times the price for something. Cool. Anyway, so basically his buddy said to him, we want you to create our new luxury brand for an equity share. We want you to create our new luxury brand for an equity share. Everybody here knows what an equity share is. It means you don't get any money. You get the promise of money in the future when this thing grows huge and they pay you all kinds of money afterwards. But you don't get any money. So it's a big change in your business model. But this was very appealing for Bob because he'd always wanted, he'd always wanted to be a brand owner. Very appealing to him. I call this the eye on the prize. You know, it's like the guy mentions this to him, Time goes by, he tells his everybody in the studio, tells his family, he's excited about it. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be a brand owner, you know. I'll get those dogs, I'll have those fancy cars, and <laughs> walk in, I'll prove creative, wear those whatever suits, you know. Anyway, so I on I call this the eye on the prize. We're all susceptible to it. So it kind of blinds you. It kind of blinds you. And also, he's under a lot of pressure, salaries, you know, he's getting beat up by various competitors, usual stuff, business, you know. So, you know, there's a downside to his life, too. So they offer him this deal. The lawyer partner gets 20, has 25%. The investor partner has 25%. Bob's buddy has 25%. What a great guy. Bob, we'll give you 10%, plus we'll give you 50K, $50,000. <clears> as expense money to cover your expenses, because we'll know there's some expenses. And we'll write that check for you right now. 25, 25, 25, 10. And uh, by the way, here we are at now. Here we are with the big show coming up. Here's the schedule. 
we need you, and we only have eight weeks. <laughs> I bet some of you have dealt with schedules like that. It's one of my favorite schedule charts. We have now, we have the big show, and then we have the time in between, which of course is never enough. And Bob says, yes. Yes. Oh, Jesus. Bob should have been thinking, this is the logic part of this, okay? I'm going to talk about the other part in a minute. He should have been thinking, they told me both 10 and 25, that was their range. They were comfortable with somewhere between 10 and 25, right? Isn't that like basic bargaining when you're buying a car? You know, it's this and this. Somewhere in here is okay, you know? Well, you took 10. Jeez. <laughs> Two. He should have been thinking, if I don't ask for more than 25%, I'll never even get to the 25%, right? If I don't ask for more than the 25%, I'll never get to the 25%. And worse, I must be at least an equal partner to get their respect. Right? Right? At least. And he's doing all the work. He's doing all the effing work. <laughs> What the lawyer is writing a contract, everybody else is doing nothing. They don't have time to engage with anyone else, right? Didn't they give him the ridiculous schedule? Hi, he's got all the leverage in the world. And most important at all, no one has the luxury experience that Bob has. Leverage, leverage, why did he say yes? <laughs> ah. I've done this myself. I actually am very sympathetic to Bob. So why? Okay. I'll tell you why. Bob was needy. Everybody's needy at some level. You know, we all have something we're needy about. Everybody is needy. Oh, I'm needy. I'm old. I'm needy. And, and he, Bob was needy, and he had his eye on the prize. So on the one hand, he was needy because he's payroll. He's got great people working for him. The business isn't growing. He worries that his creative director might leave and go to methodology. You know... You know, these pressures that we live under. And he was blinded by this glorious vision. <laughs> oh, God. I've been there. That no longer exists. That no longer exists, yeah. So, anyway, that's why. So let's talk about why. What do you do to deal with this kind of a situation so you don't, because there's quick thinking, fast thinking and slow thinking. Fast thinking is where you just respond emotionally to something. And slow thinking is where you process a little bit and think about it. So you have to protect yourself. We're all, we all do this. So you have to protect yourself against this. You have to take a deep breath and wait. So the first thing you have to do is examine your feelings. Examine your feelings about what's going on. The second thing you have to do is talk with somebody else that you truly trust. Significant other, spouse, partner, advisor, anybody that you can have an intimate conversation with about how you feel and and your fears, because the conversation helps you understand yourself. So, you know, they, talk, they don't call it the talking cure for nothing. Make a list of the possibilities. What's going on here? What might happen in this meeting? It's a week away. He knew this was coming. Make a list of possibilities. Four, remember your strengths. Remember your expertise. Huge strength, huge expertise. Five, make a list of your most significant successes. I used to carry a piece of paper in my jacket pocket that had on it the names of the projects where I could recite some significant event that we accomplished for a client. And I did that so that I could, when I got kind of like nervous, I could pull it out and say, yeah, oh God, we did that. We did that. We're, we're good, you know. <laughs> Be prepared to ask questions. Make a list of questions. Even if you don't use them, the preparation of the question thinking is a mind game you're playing with yourself. And ask as many as possible. And ask follow-up questions and take notes and then check with your person you're questioning and see if you got the note right. Never make a deal, a big deal on the spot. Remember, you have all the time in the world when you're negotiating something significant. Remember that phrase, I have all the time in the world. 
<clears throat> this is too big a risk for me not to think of myself as having all the time in the world. All right. So, Bob, how did this end? Bob is working on the project. Uh, Bob is regretting and feeling used. And I am trying to help Bob get in the mindset of renegotiating the deal. You can renegotiate almost anything. Almost anything can be renegotiated. Death can't be renegotiated. I mean, there's things that can't be renegotiated, but, but, or doing something really, truly bad. But things like this can be renegotiated, and it's actually in the client's best interest. Okay. Story number three. <clears throat> Last story, end of my talk. Cheryl takes on the bigs. Cheryl takes on the bigs. This is a recent experience. I just went through it with Cheryl. <laughs> I have to not trip up here. Here's Cheryl. She's great. Cheryl's been running her own business since, I think it was 96, something like that. She has 80 people. She started life, uh, uh, her parents were um, Peace Corps kids, and they traveled the world, and she spent a lot of time growing up in Africa and Asia and in these poor places. So she was very used to that world. Uh, she's visually very sophisticated, and she started her business uh, by doing branding for NGOs. She moved up to doing branding for big UN programs. That led her to doing branding work for multinationals, but they were mid-sized multinationals. And she had a lot of experience with mid-sized multinationals, you know, working in the US, UK, and EU <clears throat> in a particular category. So she had a lot of experience in a particular category. In fact, here's the slide I'm talking about. Large NGOs, so Cheryl's expertise fit, so this prospect, oh, I should have talked about the prospect, sorry. This prospect comes to, comes to Cheryl, and the prospect is humongous organization. They're in trouble, they're a multinational. They have a product that needs to reach first world and third world. And she's been talking with them for like six weeks or something like this. She thinks, boy, that's weird. <laughs> She thinks, that, uh, she thinks that she has the project, and there's no competitors because her experience fits this thing so well, okay? And they've been talking like she has no. So, so she's got brand, this brand experience, large NGOs, et cetera, and a, a third of their work is digital websites and social media messaging designed for both high and low end mobile. Low end mobile is really, really important in third world. And so she had a lot of experience with low end mobile marketing. Staff of 80, founded in 96, much awarded and acclaimed. Uh, it was looking good on this one, as Cheryl said to me. It was looking good on this one. So one day, she's coming into her office. The call came just as I was entering the office and I was out of breath from running up the stairs when I reached my phone. I was out of breath from running up the stairs when I reached my phone. She picks up the phone and all excited thinking this is gonna be the, <clears throat> we're starting the project. And of course what they say is Cheryl, it's her direct, it's her favorite contact there, it's uh, Senior Vice President Innovation and he says, we have to get competitors involved. Uh, Vice President of Marketing has already called two bigs, multi, multinational branders, and uh, purchasing got involved, and you know, we've got a cash crunch going on here, and we're under a lot of pressure to save money, and we just can't go ahead with this thing even though we're in a hell of a hurry. We need this rebrand desperately because we need to turn this company around. We need to show progress on our turnaround plan. Wall Street is watching but uh, I can't fight the purchasing department. Those guys, are, those guys rule around here right now. I'm personally on a vendetta against purchasing departments, so. <laughs> Cheryl called me, Cheryl called me uh, right after she hung, hung up the phone. I'd known her for a long time. I'd never worked with her. She said, I wanna hire you to help coach me through <clears throat> the negotiations, this, this deal, this is gonna come down. But anyway, she told me <clears throat> uh, after the call, she said, De dealing with the call, it made me feel sick, but I knew I had to remain cool. You know that feeling of your stomach is turning, and you know, I know it all too well. 
And the first thing she thought was, I thought I must lower the price, <laughs> but I focused on not reacting. Automatic, automatic is in a situation like this. Even someone as sophisticated as Cheryl, is you think, I got to lower the price. I got to have a price advantage over these guys. But I asked as many questions as possible. What has changed? What about the schedule? Help me understand. Help me understand my favorite question. What would I tell my team? They, I knew they thought I'd, we'd won. What would I tell my team? What would I tell my family? You know, you just. <clears throat> but he did say that we were still the best choice, but now the bigs were in it, and I know that they could win. They're very, very good. I knew I needed a moment, <clears throat> and I remembered that I had all the time in the world. I remembered that I had all the time in the world. I quickly jotted down some notes on what to say to the team, and they responded positively. So she stepped outside her office and called a little impromptu staff meeting and said, here's what's happening. And people said, all right, we're going to kick their butts. We're going to kick their butts. The waiting, the waiting's the worst. So now we got the bigs in there interviewing and doing and getting ready to do their things and putting together their presentations and all that. Cheryl's uh, director of strategy is making her calls to the client to ask more follow-up questions, but really to get market intelligence on the bigs. They try to figure out who from the bigs is going, who they're going to be facing, all that stuff. But that's just, and we sit down and go through their presentation and make some tweaks in their presentation, because they're going to have to represent. Re and then the client calls with how they're going to proceed. The client's plan. Spend three, four days at our headquarters. So come to our big city. All of you will come to our big city. So three competitors are all coming to this big city. They're trying to save time here. <clears throat> Spend three, four days at our headquarters. The CEO and uh, CMO are both going to be involved, uh, which is good. They hadn't been involved up to then, so they're getting C-suite exposure above vice president. We'll keep the three firms separate. <laughs> this is a purchasing agent invention to put pressure on the top contender. That's what this is all about. So if you have the bigs wandering around the halls, it just scares the hell out of you, you know. <clears throat> we'll announce our choice on day three. Huh. And, <clears throat> oh, guess what? Purchasing will manage the process. <laughs> so they go team assembles, they go, they grab all their stuff, they make presentations, they show their pitch again to the chief marketing officer and the uh, chief executive officer, and, uh, you know, dinners and drinking and all of that, <clears throat> and, you know, and the bigs are doing the same thing in other rooms at kind of different times, and everybody's like sweating bullets, and, uh, you know, the bigs are human beings too, so they have all the same feelings that she does, she just feels small. And she has 80 people. I mean, Landor's headcount is, I don't know, 1,000 or something. Uh, OK, here's the standard purchasing agent pitch. This project will be the making of your firm. Has anybody been told that? This project will be the making of you, or implied it? <laughs> I have. I've heard it from clients many times. We both know that you need this to move to the next level. We both know that you need this to move to the next level. <clears throat> God, Cheryl's like calling me on breaks from the restroom. I'm, I'm not in the room. I'm just in the hotel. I can't go because I'm, you know. So I'm like coaching at night and in the mornings, and then she would like call me from the hallway, from a corner. I could picture her hiding behind a plant, you know. <laughs> I don't know if it was or not. But, you know, I was desperate. I wanted to be there, but it wasn't appropriate for me to be there. So here's the next thing a purchasing agent says. Please don't force me to choose an alternative. <laughs> God. God. I mean, it sounds funny when you're sitting in the room, but when you're experiencing this, it hurts, you know? Ah, so here's the pitch from purchasing, right? You will bill us at cost. You will bill us at your cost. The acclaim will bring you more than enough business to recover your fees. You will bill us at cost. The acclaim will bring more than enough business to recover your fees. Ha! 
What a deal, huh? What a great deal. It even has some logic in it. It'll take me to the next level. I'll be fabulous. I'll be able to walk in with my dogs and my coat and have the big car. You know, eye on the prize. Cheryl says, no. <laughs> It was hard. It was hard. Hard to say no. Hard to say no. She looked carefully at everyone's eyes in the room. She looked at her team on each side of her. She said no. Help me understand. I'll write on your little tags. Help me understand why you would compromise your company's critical rebranding effort. Help me understand why you would not pay what we asked, and you know that it'll affect the quality of the work. Help me understand why a multi-billion dollar worldwide company would try to beat somebody up on a couple of million bucks. Really? Paying our fee demonstrates the respect clients have for our expertise. Paying our fee demonstrates the respect clients have for our expertise. It's about respect. And by the way, all of our clients pay our fees, and they pay them in full. And this would be an insult. This would be disrespect for our other clients if we accepted what you are suggesting. So. Meetings go on, that meeting concluded, meetings go on, social moments happen. And during one of the social moments, I think it was Cheryl's strategy person who was with her, heard the vice president of marketing remark that she was worried that this rebrand puts off the completion of our consumer website upgrade in 2013. In other words, the rebranding is going to take so long, and this process is so involved, research, discovery, et cetera, et cetera, strategy, that the consumer website project, and they desperately need those websites, because that's their consumer-facing deal, to get them out of the hole. So she heard this in one of these situations. This is why question asking is so important, because things come out that you never imagine. This had never come up before. This hadn't come up. This was a global rebranding. You know, it sure was going to affect the websites, but it wasn't a part of the program. This is an opportunity to change the context. This is one of the things that experts do. You change the context because you are an expert and you know how to help the client better than they do. And so you change the context to fit what the client needs. So overnight that night, Cheryl's team created a new offer that included the global consumer sites. They added a half a million bucks to the, to the deal. They, showed a, they created a plan. They did their whole little thing. We did these schematics. It was very cool to do it. Hotel printer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, maybe it was Kinko's. I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> and, uh, so, and they were prepared for the final meeting that was going to happen the next day. They knew that they had the last meeting of the three, which meant that they were still the preferred provider. They were still in that status, but you can still lose because there's, corporations are not of one mind. So there are many people in this room. All of them have different agendas. So on the final day, the client surprised them. The client offered each competitor a fee for initial creative. No one expected that. Now, that happens all the time, but no one expected it in this, in this thing because they expected some marching orders. We're going to go ahead with these people or not go ahead with these people. So they didn't, the client decided to put off the decision. They offered a fee to all three, a substantial fee, a substantial fee to each of the three competitors to do initial creative. And the client said, this way we won't lose any more time and we'll be on our way when we do choose one of you. So they have three creative options. Oh, isn't that fabulous? And, uh, <clears throat> you know. <laughs> Cheryl said no. 
In our experience, creative bake-offs don't result in the quality that got you interested in working with us in the first place. Creative bake-offs do not result in the quality that got you interested in working with us in the first place. Long pause. So in the room, the purchasing guy, the senior vice president of innovation, <clears throat> the vice president of marketing, both those two guys are um, really uncomfortable because they want Cheryl to get the job. Purchasing guy could give a damn. And, uh, but those two guys are like, mm, sad faces, you know, <laughs> sad faces. So long pause. And then Cheryl says, but we have a new approach that addresses your web issues. We will include creative for your consumer-facing sites in the branding process for a significant additional fee, but it will uh, not impact the schedule at all. And in effect, you're going to save money because you're moving to market faster. So you're going to have sales coming in faster than you would have previously. <clears throat> so everybody got excited about that. All of a sudden, the ice was broken, relief conversation, the room is happy, people are engaged, they're talking about what the possibilities are, they go over this spread thing that they, that they made and printed out, and the meeting ends with a really high note, and uh, everybody's feeling good. So, a little quick summary now before I get to the punchline. Cheryl stood apart by behaving like the expert she is. Behavior, behavior, behavior. Everything I'm talking about is how she behaved through this versus how Bob behaved. She got help and formed a series of plans in response to the situation. Moving, changing plans, she did it all the way through. She asked questions, she listened to the answers, and she adjusted as needed, used her team extensively. She defined the terms. She defined the terms and determined her course of action throughout the process. She didn't let the client run it for one second. She was polite, she was listening, she was incorporating their ideas, but she defined it. She reinforced her expertise at every opportunity from the first call to the last meeting. She never said, I think that. She always said, in our experience. She took time to recover from her first reactions. I have all the time in the world. She remembered her successes and referred to them when she felt challenged. So, client called that evening after the happy meeting and said, could you stay over, could you stay over uh, overnight, one more night in town, because we'd like to meet with you in the morning and uh, sign some papers. And she won. She won. She won. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? You must, I wished I'd done it. You must really believe in the power of your expertise when you face the lions. And that's how you stand apart. That's it. I don't know how to get the blue off when you put your, web, your email address up there. <laughs> okay, anybody have a question or whatever? Yeah? How did Bob's renegotiation uh, re go? Uh, well, first, Bob has to feel comfortable with opening the negotiations. So that's what we're working on. Yeah. Yeah, it will go well. He will get more than 10%, but he may not get 25%. Yeah. Yes? So, No, because the biggest problem, oh, I'm supposed to repeat the question. What week are we in in the schedule with Bob? Am I going to counsel him to wait till the last week, uh, which would give him more leverage on the time, obviously? Uh, no, because uh, it's hard to get him to really be willing to do this challenging, so that'll take enough time. I mean, if it could happen tomorrow, I would do it tomorrow. So it's, it's, it's all up to how Bob feels about it. Yes, Derek. Boeing story. How, how old were you? Oh, I, how old was I when, I when I did the Boeing thing? I was 22 years old. I think I started with Boeing when I was 21. I was a real baby. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Oh, great question. What is your advice for evaluating doing an equity share versus taking a fee? Okay, number one, recognize that taking an equity share is a really, really different business model than being paid fees. Because when you're paid fees, basically your business cash flows. You know, you do work and they pay you, or you can get paid in advance. I always get paid in advance. Um, and so it completely cash flows, so you never have to worry about you know, those times when you don't have enough money and lines of credit and all that kind of stuff. So it's financially a really different business model. So you have to really think through that. That's number one. That's the concern side. And of course, you need to make sure that you have a great contract and these people are honest people and that they're actually going to pay you and, and be straight with you on their financials. Okay? So you have to, try, you have to, have to do all the protective steps and legal steps to make sure that you're protected. Okay. With that, those caveats, it, I think it's a fantastic business model. We have more opportunity for makers today than any time in history. The whole maker movement is, is gaining huge steam. Some economists are claiming that it's creating a whole new economy in the, in the first world, in Europe and, and uh, the United States and Japan. People making things and making their own deals and making money off of it. And I think designers and creative people have more potential for doing that probably than most communities. So I think it's a great idea. And I have a big client right now uh, with two offices, one in Europe, one in the United States, which they are actually moving into the maker model, searching out inventors in a category that they're familiar with and creating products because they know how to design the product. They're industrial designers and brand people. They also have all the connections at all the gigantic consumer product giants. So their clients are Procter & Gamble and Kimberly Clark and, and General Mills and Colgate and so on and so forth. So they have all the connections. So they are seeing this as a real business model, and they have a couple gigs going on right now, and they're looking good. So, yeah. So I think it's a good model. Yes. Yes. Uh, touch on uh, the procurement revolution. Okay. <clears throat> With the downturn first in 2001 and the second one in 2008. Uh, Purchasing departments inside of uh, large multinationals and even local companies uh, have gained tremendous power. Also, Walmart. Walmart is driven by price. That means they're driven by, by uh, people who are really good at negotiating down their suppliers in price. So everybody's copying Walmart, and everybody is looking at how to squeeze every dollar. You've heard all, these, all the news through... 2010, 2011, about how corporate profits were growing rapidly in the first world, but employment, unemployment was still remaining low. That's because the purchasing agents were squeezing every nickel and dime of cost out of their business to drive down their costs so they could be profitable during a downtime. So we had this phenomenon of no jobs, but corporate profits way up, driven by purchasing. So that that is what's making that happen. And they're now involved in every level of our business. So for instance, there was a guy <clears throat> who uh, started life as a uh, finance guy inside of, I think it was LPK in Cincinnati, and, and saw all the numbers and saw all the negotiation with Procter & Gamble over pricing, and he left. And he had all these connections in the purchasing departments at Procter & Gamble. And he created a program which he sold to the multinational consumer product companies that said, I will save you 20%, 20 to 25% in your fees for creative services if you allow me to negotiate the contracts. And I will take a 1% of that. So in, anyways, in other words, a specialist who came from the design side who went into business of working down the prices of creative service suppliers for the, for the giants. You know, that, that kind of professionalism. And you know, we're not trained negotiators. So that's why this expertise thing is so critically important. You have to, your expertise is your leverage. They can't get, they cannot get what you do from anyone else. I'm not talking about each one of you individually. What you're doing in your careers is you're building your point of difference, and the more, the more effort you put into it, the more powerful that point of difference becomes and the more value it is. And so 
when they negotiate with you, your strongest leverage is that personal expertise. My Boeing story. Yes? I'd love to hear your perspective on how Seattle as a design um, city stands apart from the other, like San Francisco and New York and the like. Yeah. Well, Seattle does not have the, uh, the consumer product engine that the other big markets depend on. So I mean, you, the Midwest, uh, Chicago, New York, uh, Philadelphia, Boston, all those people are driven by, their businesses are driven by d uh, new product development inside the companies they serve and by uh, uh, marketing and branding and for individual products that are being launched left, right, and center. San Francisco is the same way. There's all those uh, giant corporations over there in the East Bay, Walnut Creek, et cetera, you know, um, uh, Quaker Oats and, and I can't, Safeway and... Clorox and all those guys are over there, and, and so everybody's doing that. And then there's a the little wine region, and then there's Silicon Valley. So these are all, you know, driven by that business. Here, we're not driven by those kinds of businesses. So it's way more B2B. Uh, and then it's, of course, Microsoft, and it's, of course, Boeing. And, you know, the biggest industrial, one of the biggest industrial design firms in the world is headquartered here, Teague. Anybody here from Teague? Uh, their relation, they started in 1926. Their relationship with Boeing started in 1946. Very interesting, long relationship. And so that's a driver. Boeing is a driver in this community. And lots of people have worked for Boeing. I know you guys work for Boeing. So it's a whole different kind of mix. Um, but the, the business community in Seattle is very aware of creative services and buys it all the time. That's, that's a good thing. Oh, gosh, there's tons of, you know, the question is, where should uh, you look for more information about pitching? There's tons of books on, uh, on pi I can't think of any right now, but uh, on, on uh, marketing for professional services. And, you know, but I really think that the most important thing is assessing your own skills and your fit with your client base and how you can leverage that for your own growth. In other words, I think it's, it's far better to think of it at, from a very personal, how you identify and fill needs within the client organization and being analytical about the process of identifying client needs that you can fill better than anyone else based on your history based on what your personal experience is, based on what your firm's experience is, and based on the mix of skills and experience that are a part of your firm. So I think it's all about what I described with Cheryl, where she is uh, expert in this third world thing with the NGO work and the UN work that she's done, but she's also got this experience in branding, and the combination of the two are what really really make her, from a skill and experience thing, stand out. So this particular client fit her perfectly, because that's exactly what they were looking for. And by the way, lots of people are trying to get into Africa. Lots of people are trying to get into the third world. So, you know, so it's that kind of thing. And she grew up with it. I mean, you know, basically it's like she grew up. I mean, you know, I mean, my career started when, you know, I drew Columbus's ships in the second grade, and I figured out that the flags went the same way the wind did, not off the back of the ship. And the teacher complimented me on it, and I've never forgotten it, you know? It's that kind of stuff that, in fact, I think that is the core of where your marketing comes from. So I, that's why I don't approach it from an academic standpoint. I approach it from a kind of pragmatist, figuring out a need. Oh, Microsoft <laughs> needs is marketing itself through events. This is, this is Ted in... 1990, probably. Microsoft is marketing itself through events because they're trying to get all these, all these people who write code and all these different things to align with them to make their platforms more powerful and to gather all this stuff into their things. Ah, we need to go approach their events group and show them that we do great design. Every one of these little events has a 
logo and has posters and has this and has that and it was pre-web and God, it was launched off huge business. I mean, we're doing like, I don't know, a couple million bucks a year with Microsoft, all from starting with their events people because we identified a need we could fill uniquely. They had it and we changed our business. So in effect, then what happened is we went, God, if we got to hang on, this is huge. If we got to hang on to this, we better behave right. So we hired account people because <laughs> the designers would just screw up all the time with the clients. <laughs> and it cost us big time, you know. So we learned from Microsoft taught us how to behave in an appropriate way so that we could actually meet their needs. And we hung on. We hung on. Uh, Carolyn was reminding me yesterday of going to a meeting with one of our designers who was very, very talented, uh, but just kind of, you know, and out there, well, she was lovely. She's beautiful work. And Carolyn was like being the suit on this thing. And it was the number two guy at Microsoft at the time. I can't remember his name, but it was a long time ago. And uh, big guy. He was, oh, and, and uh, she had designed the logo for his chili competition. <laughs> and the guy asked her, uh, you know, in the meeting, said, well, what inspired you to come up with this? He really liked it. What inspired you? She said, oh, I don't know. You know. <laughs> Carolyn said to her, ah! <laughs> but so, and we survived those things. And <laughs> just to the real world, you know. Yeah. Okay, need to wrap it up. One more question. <laughs> or no more questions. I have a question too. Mark. Okay, David. How do, you, do you have any suggestions on dealing with a situation where you've been provided a, a budget by the client yeah. uh, that, that may not be what you feel is appropriate for the budget? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. They provide you a budget of $50,000 and it's a $100,000 job. Yeah, what do you do about that? And what you do is you ask them a lot of questions about how they, how they formulated this budget and how they determined uh, that $50,000 was the appropriate amount for the budget. And from the questioning, what should happen is you should find out if it's an arbitrary amount. Is it an arbitrary amount that's been forced on them? Or it's an amount that they've carefully calculated based on the services that they you know, they said, well, it's going to be 10,000 of this and five of that and 22 of this and so on and so forth. So you're going to find out from that. And then you're going to say, hmm, in that list, if it's in, ca in fact a list, you have not covered what you're going to need to do to do the social media and uh, SEO and the whatever, whatever that you know is necessary to actually meet the need and will cost the additional thousand. So you use your expertise to show them how it, if they want to accomplish the goals that they need to actually do these other things. So you change the context by using expertise. The other side of it is where the budget is arbitrary and it's been given to them by a purchasing agent, then it's simply a number and it's not a number that has a rationale about it. And then what you have to do is basically uh, show them why what they need to, you have to actually go back and show them examples of the kinds of things that you've done that in fact meet these kinds of needs and explain to them why it costs the $100,000. So those are two different ways of taxing it, yeah. Just a quick one. Yes, quick last question. What if you're not actually an expert? You're not an expert yet. Uh, how could that be possible? <laughs> what if you're actually not an expert is the question. How could that be possible? Uh, I just, you're, maybe it's a new technology that you are familiar with, but you are not an expert. But you are selling, you, you're in a pitch where you are selling oh. this. Oh, OK. Like that, that kind of right, thing. yeah, OK. Uh, so you're, you're, you're not an expert because it's a technology and you're in a pitch and you're in the marketing mode and your job is to help win the business. It's not, your job is not the person who supplies the skills that does know. Well, then you have to team with somebody who is an expert. And 
all sales and all pitch situations are far better with two or three people involved from your side than they are being singular. So you must get an expert to be your partner, and then you work out between the two of you the relationship that you will have through those meetings with the client so that one of you can play the facilitation role, reading the expressions and understand what the client is saying to you both directly and indirectly, and the other of you is being the expert who can you know, talk about the technology and the skills that are required and so on. So you, and that's always the case. I didn't include any of that here, but that's always the case in marketing is you want teams because these are complex projects that we're dealing with with complex outcomes and very complicated methods for actually uh, gathering the information to make the program happen. They always need teams and the sales, the sales process is no different. You need a team. Thank you.